I'm Dr. Shockey, and welcome back to the interdental space. This was supposed to be the routine excision of a fibroma, but what I found hiding under his gums taught me a valuable lesson. There is some blood in this video, so if that bothers you, I might recommend skipping this one. So we see this lesion here on the gingiva. The patient wants it out, and it's down in his smile line, and it's even starting to encroach on the palatal gingiva as well and so it's starting to bother him quite a bit. It isn't painful to the touch, but it is starting to push his teeth apart, as you can see between number nine and 10. Here you see we're making an incision in the gingiva going all the way down to bone. Since I didn't want to tear the gingiva, I went ahead and made a full thickness flap by making releasing incisions on the mesial and the distal of the affected area so that we could get a little more stretch of the tissue and hopefully not tear it. My main concern here is actually interrupting the blood supply to the tissue that we have left over. So I'm trying to be really careful not to cause any tears. And I wanna be able to spare as much tissue as I can. So I'm envisioning in my mind how I want it, the flap to lay once we're all done and have everything sutured up. So trying to be really meticulous about that. And I'm trying not to make any more incisions than are absolutely necessary. This tissue is essentially the same as a fibroma. I mean, that's what our differential diagnosis was, but that means there's not a lot of vascularity to it. And the only vascularity that we're gonna have left over is from the superficial layer of gingiva that's overlying this fibroma. And so we're trying to save some of that and save the blood supply. And most of that blood supply is gonna be through capillaries that are running through the gingiva at the superficial level. There's not really any uh, arterioles or arteries in this area. So you can see what we're doing here is we're essentially um, making a split thickness incision where we are separating that superficial one to one and a half, two millimeters of gingiva from the underlying fibroma. You would say, well, aren't you gonna leave, be leaving behind cells from the fibroma? Well, yes, I, I will be by doing that, but it's acceptable in this case because these cells are not like cancer cells that have this unending growth potential, like a wart, for example, where you have these cells that just wanna replicate and replicate. Once the irritant is gone from this area, these cells should stop replicating and we shouldn't get a ton more growth in this area, everything should just kind of go back to normal. So even though you could go ahead and just remove the whole fibroma and take all that tissue with it all the way down to movable mucosa, the, the, the issue with that is then you don't have anything to cover the bone once you're done and you're going to end up with just a little bit longer healing process. So I would rather go ahead and utilize this tissue that we have and allow it to work as our overlying um, kind of a band-aid for this area as everything heals in. Now you can see here, I'm releasing all these little periosteal fibers that are holding this fibroma to the periosteal tissue. And uh, a lot of times, you know, you have these little indentations in the bone where it kind of can uh, get caught up. So you need to get your blade in that area. Now I'm elevating here with the periosteal elevator. Now we're going to send whatever we remove here off for biopsy, but we're fairly certain that it's benign. And so that means we're going to be very conservative in our removal of this lesion. We're just trying to remove the lesion. We're not necessarily trying to remove clean borders or try to remove underlying bone. In fact, my main goal here is actually just making incisions in a way that allows us to put the tissue back together in the most natural appearance as possible. Now, once we had this flap reflected, we went ahead and did some scaling because as you know, once you have a full thickness flap reflected, you can just see all the tartar that's laying there underneath the gingival tissue and it makes it really easy to clean very well. So we got all that calculus cleaned up and then I, I thought what I was going to do was just to remove tissue down to bone and then stop at the bony level and not change any of the bony architecture. That was my plan. But as you can see here, when we fully reflected the tissue, we found an osteophyte or kind of a bone spur type of formation right underneath the gums and at the base of that fibroma, which it's kind of hard to know, was the bone growth stimulating the gingiva to grow or the other way around? Most likely, it kind of all came together. So yeah, this was bony. 
I went ahead and removed it using a rongeurs. And then I took a surgical high speed and used that to smooth down the bone in that area. I wanted to make sure that I at least took off that bony spur and kind of the root of it, you could say, just in case that bone still has a propensity to overgrow. Now, unfortunately, the tissue did tear when I was elevating the periosteum off of the bone. And I believe that was partly due to the fact that that bone spur is kind of an irregular surface. And it's always super hard to elevate soft tissue off of an irregular surface of bone because your periosteal elevator kind of gets caught and kind of it can't apply even force to the tissue as you're trying to elevate it up and it can oftentimes tear. Another spot where we encounter this a lot is when we're doing sinus lifts through a lateral window on the maxilla and you make your sinus lift right next to where there's a transverse septum through the sinus and there's that bony spicule there. It's really hard to elevate off of any kind of irregularity like that when you're trying to lift the Schneiderian membrane up. And in those cases, that's where we can oftentimes get a tear of the, of the sinus membrane. So anyway, back to the case, I was able to reapproximate the edges of the tear and suture it up with monoglyc suture 5.0. And I think we'll still be able to get enough lateral blood supply coming in through those capillaries that we left where that tissue should stay viable. So this is my lesson for this video. Always expect the unexpected. Go slow and be prepared to pivot if things don't go according to plan or you see something different in the middle of a procedure than what you expected. In this case for me, it was that bone spur. I could have been more careful when I was elevating off uh, in that area and possibly could have avoided tearing the tissue. Also, the fact that we found this bone spur did mean that I had to do a small amount of what was technically an alveoplasty, removal of that bony tissue, which was something that we had not anticipated. And so that's why it's really important to always have an extra line on your consent form that gives you permission to do extra procedures in the middle of a procedure if you deem them necessary. Because in this case, the patient was sedated and we weren't able to wake him up to say, hey, uh, we need to do, you know, extra, extra procedures. I mean, that, that would be, you can't really wake a patient up super well from anesthesia to a point where they're able to give consent. We'd have to literally bring him back the next day. So that's why we always have a line in our consent forms that says, hey, if we see something that needs us to change the treatment plan in the middle of the case, we'll be able to do that and do the best thing for the patient. Our patients trust us. They want us to do what's best for them. They want us to just diagnose and treat as we go. They don't want to have to come back for a second procedure in most cases. Now, there are some patients, obviously, that would prefer to know everything that you're going to do. And that's why it's so important to have that extra line in your consent form so they can decide like, hey, no, I don't want you doing anything extra, even if it's kind of to my own detriment. So yeah, that was a, that was a big good reminder on this case for me. Now, hopefully we won't ever need to see this patient back for another surgery. The recurrence rate of this kind of peripheral ossifying fibroma is around 15%. So it is a possibility. And we did discuss that with him before the procedure. Um, and actually the working diagnosis of a peripheral ossifying fibroma is something that I came to at the end of the procedure. Prior to the beginning of the procedure, I was thinking of this as a irritation fibroma, potentially due to poor oral hygiene, calculus in the area, or some other kind of an irritating factor. But once again, once we got in there, we found that there was something different than what we what we realize, and when we look back on radiographs, I do see that there is a little more radio opacity in that area between number nine and ten, as you can see here. Uh, but you know, sometimes it's hard to tell on a radiograph. You know, is that extra bone? Now, obviously, if we had taken a CT scan ahead of time, that would have showed us that extra bone in that area. But we had not exposed a CT scan because I was expecting this to just be kind of the routine excision of a fibroma, maybe something that I could have done, but it all turned out good in the end. When we get the report back from pathology, we're going to know for sure what this was, whether it was a peripheral ossifying fibroma or if it was just an irritation fibroma or potentially even a pyogenic gland although it doesn't really seem consistent with that or something else. You know, we can't rule out cancer until we have that biopsy back, which is why we get the biopsy and we get the results from the pathology lab and discuss them with our patients. Thank you so much for watching. Please leave a comment and let me know what you would have done differently. See you next time in the interdental space.